Hello, welcome back. Mike from Canavan. Well, today we are talking about inflation and interest rates as usual these days. Uh, these three articles are really what I want to cover. This first article is kind of the lead in article to get us talking about it. It went up on the website, I think on Monday. So it asks, did corporate earnings feed inflation? I'll jump to the kind of conclusion here. I'm sure they had some impact on it. Uh, but you know, if you're out there of the camp that the reason the American economy is struggling and inflation is because companies are trying to make money. Nothing's really changed there. Companies have always tried to make as much money as they can. It's kind of their role. And maybe our view of that role has changed a little bit. Um, but I don't think corporate greed has really changed from the 80s. You know. uh, what what are the driving factors? Oh boy, where do we start the list? So these are the two articles I kind of want to cover and I've got some talking moments. So this first one, why inflation around the world just won't go away and where's the recession we were promised? Because you would think that these two things would be, if inflation had stuck around, boy, we'd really be in a rat, bad uh, economy because not only did we raise interest rates really high, but we're facing record high inflation. By record, I mean just over the last 15 years. Uh, we'd be in a really bad recession, and we, you know, all other indicators do not point to that fact. So, I've got some talking notes here. The first is this quote from the first article: "Why inflation around the world just won't go away," and it's really talking about the speed by which we can expect these interest rates to affect the global economy and inflate in inflation. So. We've, over the last year, aggressively raised interest rates, at least here in the U.S. Uh, Europe has been raising them for about half of the time. And we're kind of at a point where we think we've raised them enough, but we have to just give it time to see what's going to happen. And you're starting to hear kind of out of the Fed now, we may or may not be raising them in the future, which has been a dramatic change from the past, which is the second bullet, which is the fact that central bankers have been substantially more transparent about what their plans are for the future, specifically over the last couple of years, than they have been really for most of kind of modern dealing with, with policymakers, that likely the changes we're making to, to interest rates are probably affecting the economy faster, but probably not in some dramatic way. Right? So, um, we still have to give it time. However, we're in a very important spot that if we have overshot, we drive the economy into a recession. But if we haven't been aggressive enough, then inflation will kind of take back over. And here's where we're going to start talking about the meat of what I want to talk about, which is the fact that there is no one single thing or knob or dial that anyone can change that has such a dramatic impact on the economy that they have any hope of really steering it substantially on course or off course. Um, you know, for example, this bullet here on inflation supply side versus you know, versus interest rate driver. There is a whole camp of economists that will tell you this whole topic topic about what we're going to do with interest rates is just a short term thing. Inflation is always going to be driven by money supply, meaning if there's 20% more dollars in the world, then eventually you're going to get paid 20% more. Everything's going to cost 20% more. Your savings account's going to have 20% more in it. Stock market's going to be 20% higher because there's that money's just going to work its way through the system. Everyone will have more and we'll be spending it, you know, you know on things. And in interest rates is just how quickly are we going to get there? Is it going to be a slow rise to there or is it going to be too fast? Similarly, there's lots of talks around, one of my very first videos on the channel was around inflation predictors, whether you should be using what we expect inflation to be versus or what it currently is, right? And if those things are similar, then inflation will probably be what you expect it to be, right? You, what you predict it to be. Because like, if you go back to the 80s, interest rates were, or inflation rates were high, and people expected them to stay high, right? So expected and current were the same thing. And shocker, that, that, that happened. And it took dramatic action and a long time for us to move from the late 70s, early 80s of high, in, high inflation that stuck around to where we were really in the 2000s, where we finally got inflation you know, kind of modern below 4 to 5%. And expected and current again started to align of it's low and we expect it to be low. Now we're in this strange world where we expect interest rates to go back to where they were, which is below 2% and inflation to go back below 2%. 
But current inflation is still pretty high in the four and a half to five and a half percent if you're looking at core. And it really has been kind of what I would call level for the last four to six months. And you know, has not necessarily been trending down. Gas prices, which are very volatile, have caused it to start trending down when you look at it overall. So that's going to lead into this very last quote, which is uh, talking about yield curve inversions, because we have been in an inverted yield curve for a very long time, which means the three-year treasury is trading higher than the 10-year treasury, which is a little off. You would expect if you're going to tie your money up for a longer period of time that you would get a better rate of return by any 10-year treasury, but that's not the case. The rate is for, for a three-year treasury is better. That in the past has typically predicted a recession, but this article talks about whether that is correlative or causational. Um, and it, 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 it specifically calls out these two examples of, yes, we had yield curve inversions in these two examples, but it's hard to say that that's what caused the recession. For example, here in 2019, it, it, you know, if it's June of 2019 and the yield curve inverts, it's hard to say that that's going to predict the pandemic that occurred at the end of 2019, really, or the early 2020. And we, yes, we technically went into a recession during that time because of unemployment and lots of things, but the economy did really shockingly well through that, came out, the stock market certainly had a raging year in 2020, as well as 2021. And similarly, if you went back to 1973, where we had a yield curve inversion, it was hard to say that that predicted the Arab oil embargo, right? So, Yield curve inversions are very interesting times to, to look at. We've been in one for quite a while now, but it does not mean that a recession is coming, which is you know, kind of what this article is talking about. Now, back up to this. Will we enter a recession? Of course we will. Like eventually we're going to. <laughs> we thought it was going to come in 2020 when COVID happened. Then we kind of like realized it wasn't going to. The economy was raging in 2021. We have the kind of exuberance. Uh, inflation starts taking over. Then we start talking about, oh, it's going to be the end of 2022. That never really materializes. Unemployment has been at record low levels. And now we're here in the middle of 2023 and saying, it doesn't look like it's coming this year either. Uh, so maybe it's going to come next year, maybe the year after. What's going to be the cause of it? It's tough to say that at this point it was COVID, right? It, COVID does seem not that long ago, but we are talking about 2020. Um, it's going to be something, but uh, it's unlikely that any of us are going to predict it. All right, moving on to the next slide. So really what I want to talk about is not that what I think is causing inflation or interest rates, because whatever I think is almost guaranteed wrong, because there are just way too many things that influence the economy and inflation. And interest rates is really just the only knob that the Fed has that they can adjust to try and control. But there's so much more, you know, uh, executive policy, legislative policy, in you know the president and, and uh, Congress, and just general market trends, changes in population, changes in consumer spending, development of, of developing nations, right? There's just so many things that to say that it is X, Y, Z that is changing that and that we are headed in the right direction or the wrong direction because of one thing done by one organization, right? And the Fed even has the best hope because it's the largest economy and the U.S. and interest rate is very impactful. Imagine you're, you know, changing interest rates in India or something that is certainly an emerging nation that has a dramatic impact on the world, but you don't, you can't possibly hope to help, you know, talk about global impact, global inflation. You have, you have no power, right? Um, so there's no single explanation that is going to give us what is going to affect inflation or interest rate in any News person or talking head, myself included, that is saying, oh, someone is screwing up because, and this is going to be really bad because they've made this decision. That decision maybe affects 5% of the solution. And maybe they're not getting it 100% right, but I bet in some way they're right, right? So it's, it's this uh, next bullet, no policy can be perfect. The policies we have are guaranteed to be wrong. They're just especially in the way our government works, which I actually think it works pretty well. I'm not of the camp that we're like, we're doomed to failure because our, our government can't act. 
the fact that it can't act in some ways is, is its own, some of its own strongest uh, benefit when it comes to the economy. It's, it's that these people making policies, they have to work within a certain system and they're, they're just going to do their best. And whatever that is, is, is what we're going to get for policy is never going to be perfect. And that's normal. No one, no country in the world has perfect policies or even remotely close to perfect policies. The good news there is that doesn't really affect the economy that much in one way, right? You put a, a, a embargo on whatever product it is. It's going to have a very small impact on the economy as a whole. The next is this idea that we're always kind of striving for normal, but never arriving. We always kind of think of the past as like normal, that we're in an abnormal situation now. The simple truth is the past was never normal. You can't pick out any time where there was not like these very interesting stressors on the economy, right? You might think like, well, before COVID was normal, right? Because COVID was crazy. But um, now before that, we were talking about, right, there was like the trade war with, uh, with China initiated largely by Trump. And that was very disruptive. We didn't understand because we were in the, like the, the middle of globalization at this time. And then all of a sudden the two biggest economies were putting these massive tariffs on each other. And we didn't understand how, what was going to happen. And you keep going back before that, there was always something strange. So we're always talking about a normal is some place we want to get back to. And yet but the economy is never normal. It's always just what it is with these odd stressors that, that are pointing it in a direction. So like the example I often give when we talk to clients about the economy is like we talk about it like a big ship that's very slow to move, like a big you know ocean going vessel that you can turn the rudder, but it doesn't start moving immediately. It takes a very long time to turn. And then you can even kind of turn the rudder the other way and it won't start going that way for a long time. I used to be in the Navy. Submarines work exactly like this. They're very slow to control when you when you drive them. And we say like, you know. The president, the policies of the president can be little nudges on this ship and what Congress is doing and what other countries are doing and all sorts of things can kind of nudge this ship. But it's very hard to turn that ship off whatever course it's good, whether the course is good or bad. And I think a better analogy is you turn that ship into a whole fleet of ships, some of which are like little sailboats or big tankers or little, you know, pleasure craft, little you know, speed boats or cruise ships. And there's all sorts of things that affect them. The wind, the current, the waves, how many workers they have, the price of oil. And to try and put on someone's shoulders to be able to control all of that, it's just unrealistic to expect that our policymakers are going to make perfect decisions. Even good decisions is hard to put on them especially when you put on them all the limitations of working within a democracy like the U.S., where those of us who vote who are probably wrong on 95%, myself included, on the things that we think, they have to appease us when they go to Washington so that they can get reelected to do it, right? It's just very, very difficult. So it's not that policymakers are guessing, right? They're not guessing. They're doing their best, which will almost invariably, not be good enough. When you come to this realization about the economy, I often try and point this out to my clients during elections. It can be surprisingly relaxing when you realize there's very little we can do to affect the economy. And whatever organization is nudging it one way, there's a bunch of other organizations and people and policies and events that are nudging it the other way. And some of those nudges sometimes direct it into a way like 2008, where we get the global financial crisis. Right? That took years to happen, right? Uh, COVID is probably the best example of something that had a massive nudge to it, right? And that ship and all, all of those ships are kind of going crazy right now because we have never seen in the modern world what happens when you shut down the global economy for like six months, right? It was just it's totally unprecedented. We have no idea. And now we're trying to nudge these ships back in the right, right direction. And everyone's they're doing their best. I went back to, I already said that this is the point I try and get across to clients because when an election comes, we are talking about, I have 
you know, hundreds of different clients that come in and talk to me and they want to know what's going to happen after the election. Are you worried if political party A is going to get elected? And, and I have a very diverse group of clients. They all have a political party they like and don't like, like all of us. And I always have to try and explain to them that no matter what the news is trying to tell you or your own head, or, you know, because it makes sense that they, the president would have a large impact really doesn't matter who wins the election. The economy is going to be headed in the direction it's headed, and very few things can turn it off of that direction. Major events like COVID, 2008 global financial crisis, uh, we just don't have a lot of control over it. So we can certainly critique people for their policies and do the absolute best we can to try and drive it. But to blame any one organization or one person or event on the direction of the economy, in this case, talking about inflation, is just a fool's gambit. It's not something that we can really pin on that. So that is really it. Um, I am back from my trip, for those of you that kind of follow me personally. And uh, you'll probably see some changes here. I fixed the lights, so I'm not uh, filming in a cave anymore, which I'm very excited about. I still have a few things to, to fix. You'll probably see some changes on the slides. Uh, if you do like my content, please do like the video. It helps a lot. And uh, subscribe for future content. And I hope to see you soon here.